Hey, this is Natalie Grant, and you're listening to Dispatch Radio. In the primeval history of Genesis, an ancient war began between the seed of the serpent and the seed of Eve. Fallen angels called Watchers begot a race of giants called Nephilim, their goal to stop the bloodline of the promised seed. But God had other plans. Chronicles of the Nephilim is a biblical fantasy series of novels that charts the rise and fall of the Watchers and the Giants in the stories of the Bible and in between. Read all eight novels from Noah Primeval all the way to Jesus Triumphant. Available on Kindle and paperback at Amazon.com. Go to ChroniclesOfTheNephilim.com and enter a world of ancient history and biblical imagination. That's ChroniclesOfTheNephilim.com. All right, folks, we have a great guest back with us. He's got a brand new book coming out. You've heard us talk about the Chronicles of the Nephilim before. This is book seven. David Ascendant and Brian Gadow is on with us again. Brian, how are you doing, my friend? Good, man. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate well, it. Well, congratulations for another great novel. It's uh, great to see this uh, manifest. And uh, obviously, we'll jump in with some of the, the semantics and give everybody a little synopsis on, uh, you know, what David Ascendant is about and how that fits into the, the biblical story that we all know. Sure. Well, you know, it's part of a series. It's the seventh book in a series. And people can people could read it as a standalone, uh, especially if they know, you know, the David story. I think that they'll appreciate it. However, there is a lot of there's a lot of things that they'll they'll appreciate more if you know it's not like they're going to be confused but they're definitely not going to uh, appreciate as much detail if they read it as, as if they read it in the whole series because what happens is um, Chronicles of the Nephilim is the series and it's based on this you know the very first messianic Bible passage in the Bible is Genesis three fifteen where it says God's cursing the ser- serpent and he says. You know, I, I will place enmity between your seed, the seed of the serpent, and the seed of the woman, which is, um, you know, he says, you should, he will, you will bite his heel, he will crush your head. And scholars explain that that's the first messianic promise, that the Messiah will crush the head of the seed of the serpent. And so I, I basically said, you know, this is a fascinating storyline. And then as I studied the Bible closer about the Nephilim, the Watchers, and the Giants, which is was always sort of like a a weird Bible passage in Genesis 6, 1 through 4, you know, and and uh, as I looked into it more, I found out that there's a story going on in the Bible, the War of the Seed, and it's connected to these giants somehow, and these giants show up in other passages. So I thought to myself, well, if I could, if I could tell the story, go back in and retell Bible stories everywhere the giants show up in some way or manner, and, and these watchers of these sons of God, um, and retell those stories so you can see the storyline that's going on. And that's what I do with Chronicles of the Nephilim. So it started out with Noah, and the first book is Noah Primeval. Then it goes to Enoch Primordial, and that's sort of like a prequel. So I jump back in time and tell Enoch's story. Then I go to Gilgamesh Immortal, then Abraham Allegiant. And Abraham Gilgamesh is, people say, well, that's not Bible hero, but he's the first, one of the first mighty kings after the flood who seeks eternal life, and he seeks out Noah. Um, and then you've got Abraham Allegiant, and that's the story of Abraham. And people don't think of, people think of Abraham as some shepherd, and uh, he's a peaceful guy. But if you read Genesis 14, you find out that no, actually Abraham was a warrior because he hunted down an army of a multi-city army, five cities I think it is, that captured his nephew Lot. He hunted them down and rescued Lot and all their booty from those, that army. And so Abraham was actually a mighty warrior himself. And in that same passage, Genesis 14, it talks about these giant clans who are in the land at the time. And then, of course, you move on into the promised land where Joshua, uh, you know, is going to take the promised land and it says there are Anakim giants in the land, right? And, um, and what are those giants? And what, why, why is God going out of his way to send Joshua to kill all the giants? Because in Joshua 11, it says Joshua hunted down the Anakim giants to kill them out of the land. But, and so I tell that story in Joshua Valiant and Caleb Vigilant. Those are that's books five and six. And then it ends up, the latest volume, it's not ended yet, but the latest volume is David Ascendant. 
And what happens is, in, in the time of Joshua, um, I, you know, I've got a bunch of, like, weird noises in my ear. Are you okay on your side? I'm doing great. Doing great. Oh, okay. So um, so in the book of Joshua, it says that Joshua killed, got, took care of all the Anakim giants in the land, except for he left the cities on the coast. And there's a couple cities there, Gaza and Gath and some other cities. And guess what those cities are? They're cities of the Philistines. So it says that Joshua left the Philistines alone and didn't, t- didn't kill those giants. And why? I do not know why. But I do know that the, the next big hero that comes into the storyline is David. And David, of course, kills Goliath. We know that that's the famous story. He's a giant. But Goliath is not the only giant in the story of David. And so David becomes the Messiah king who sort of finalizes wipes out all the last of the Rephaim Philistine giants in the land. And this was the thing that really blew my mind, because um, when I was looking into research for the David story, I found out that there are actually, uh, let me find them. Uh, okay, there we go. So in my research, I found that, that in the story of David, in the book of Chronicles, in the book of Second uh, Samuel, we read about five other giants who were hunting after David. So like in 2 Samuel 21, they even give the names of some of these giants. One of them is called right. Ishbi Benob, and another one's called Saf, and another one is Lami, the brother of Goliath. And it's like, wow, the brother of Goliath, well, he probably obviously had revenge on his mind, but it said specifically that Ishbi Benob fought to kill David with this new sword that he had. And all these giants are given in this context that they're hunting, they're after King David. Why, why, why are the giants hunting him, right? And so this, this is a fascinating storyline. That's the storyline I decided to tell in, in David Ascendant. I, I go into the Philistine culture. I show, you know, it's pagan, right? And it's pretty wicked and violent. And I, I show all that. And then I show Goliath as a young man and how he, rises up with these other six, or I'm sorry, with these other five giants. And it calls these giants descendants of the giants in, in 2 Samuel and, and, and First Chronicles. And that phrase in Hebrew is actually Yelid HaRafa. And there's a, there's a scholar, Conrad LaRue, who, who makes an argument that this phrase, Yelid HaRafa, may actually be a reference to a military cult of giants, because the word Rafa is reference to the Rephaim, and in the Bible, Rephaim are giants, and that this phrase may be a specialized phrase, so there may have been a, a military cult of giants, and, and they're all specifically going after King David. So this is a fascinating story, so I went into the lives of these different giants, and then, you know, I mean, it, the Bible doesn't tell us anything more about them, just that they were after David, and they were killed by David's mighty men. But I go in and I, you know, I do a little speculation and I, I sort of re, retell the story of these giants and where they came from. And, and uh, then I integrate it into, into the story of King David. And so it's all about David's ascendancy when he was on the run from Saul and, and uh, when he met his first wife, Michael, and fell in love with her. And then later on, he, fell, he falls in love with Abigail, who becomes his third wife. And I have the romantic story in there as well. But I, I, I tell David's story as a man who's conflicted. He's a man who has a heart after God, but he also is, has a weakness for women and a bent for blood. He's a man of bloodshed, so he's violent. So he's a, a, a man of complexity who struggles with passion, passionate sin as well as passionate uh, spirituality, right? And that's sort of the, 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 sort of the genesis of the David Ascendant story, because I I thought, how can I tell a story that people haven't heard a hundred times before? Uh, you know, I, I think David and Goliath is, is cliche now. I've heard it so many times, right? And I thought, well, what can I do that will give a fresh view on this without really contradicting the Bible? And this whole giant angle came in that was fascinating to me. And uh, then, of course, it says that David ends up wiping out these giants in the Valley of the Rephaim. And so, in other words, they, st- they named the valley after those Rephaim giants who David ultimately conquered. And so, as the Messiah King, David is sort of finalizing this, this victory over the seed of the serpent as, 
uh, as as symbolized in the these roughing giants who are who are after him, right? And after that, you don't really hear anything more about the giants in the Bible, you know. And so that's kind of the story I ch- I chose. And so I think people are going to find they're going to find the story of David and Goliath. They're going to see some stuff they're all familiar with, but they're also going to see an angle and some some storytelling that they that is in the Bible, but not very detailed, and they haven't heard before or they haven't really noticed, right? And so that was sort of the the, the genesis and 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 where I you know what sort of drove me to to, to tell this new story in, in the seventh volume of the series. Well, it's definitely a definitely a fresh fresh new angle and really a lot more depth. And could you touch on a little bit about what are some of the other sources and some of the other things that you were able to find from a historical context and some of the other things you did in your research? Yeah, you know, there's look here, one of one of my interests in writing this series, Chronicles of the Nephilim. <clears throat> is that I wanted to sort of deal, face some of the weird things in the Bible that don't jive well with my modern Western understanding of my faith, you know? And we see these things in the Bible and we ignore them because they don't fit in, you know? And, and I think that that's not being honest enough. And so I want to I face these things and deal with them and try to understand them in the original context. And, and so my, my intent on writing the Bible series is to it's more of a theological novel than it is a historic you know it's historical fiction but um, but it's kind of more theological because I want to pull back the curtain and show some of the spiritual realities that the Bible talks about but the Bible also uses a lot of you know has some strange things and I don't want to ignore those I want to try to incorporate them in, in in my understanding so for example another one strange thing that shows up in the David story is what's called the Lion Men of Moab. And in 2 Samuel 23, we read about Benaiah, who's the captain of David's guard. He was a valiant, mighty man, a doer of great deeds. And it says he struck down two Ariels of Moab. And this particular translation just says Ariels of Moab. But they, that's actually a transliteration because they're not entirely sure what the word mm-hmm. may mean. But some scholars point out that it's a sort of a hybridization word of like lion and God, like lion of God. And, you know, some people could say, well, you know, these these are lion men of Moab, maybe because they're called that because they're warriors and they fight like lions and that we all know that. Right. But there's more to it than that, because in other literature in other ancient literature, um, the interpretation of Ariel's is more than than that. There is this sort of possible hybridization of maybe men that are kind of look like lions, like maybe they're hybrids of some kind. I don't know. It's weird. It's strange. And I'm not sure entirely what it means, but there's references. There's another reference in first Chronicles 12, eight talks about the Gadites and the Gadites were a tribe that went over to David at the stronghold in the wilderness, mighty and experienced warriors. And it says that their faces were like the faces of lions and who were swift as gazelles upon the mountains. Okay, well, that's isn't that obviously symbolism? Swift as gazelle. Yeah, I, I, I'm not denying that. But to say whose faces were like lions, rather than saying they fought like lions or anything like that, to say that their faces looked like lions might be an indication that there's more to it than that, and these might be the lion men of Moab. And interestingly, the tribe of Gadites that they came from was over on the other side of the Jordan, and guess where the, 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 the allotment of land that the Gadites were in guess where that was? It was in Moab. And so it's possible that, that these Moabites became converts to the tribe of Gad, and some of them were these lion men, and they looked kind of like lions to these people, you know? And so, you know, I, I, I incorporate those into my story with King David, and, and um, you know, I go out full bore and call them, you know, they have lions, they have lion-like faces with names and stuff, and, you know, how much does it do that? How much is that in reality? I don't know. But I'm making the spiritual point that there's these strange things, and I'm incorporating it into the Bible. Or, I'm sorry, I'm incorporating it into my story and trying to be as true to the Bible as I can while filling in between the lines with a, some imagination that sort of communicates that spirituality. So I've got these lion men of Moab who are like lion like warriors, and it says that Benaiah killed two of them. So I thought, well, if they con- converted and, and, and joined David, but then two of them were killed, maybe two of them were traitors. So I kind of tell the storyline of, of how it is that Benaiah came to kill those two lion men, you know, out of the, the group of 11 that, that are named in First Chronicles. And so that's one other example of, of sort of like 
incorporating some of the strange things in the Bible in, in an ancient Near Eastern context. You know, and in previous uh, volumes of the Chronicles, I, I included like satyrs, you know, like during the, um, mm-hmm. uh, in the book of Joshua Valiant and Caleb Vigilant, my two novels about the Holy Land. There's a lot of references to these like goat demons. And the goat demons were basically satyrs. And there's a lot of references in the Bible in Isaiah and Jeremiah uh, and even Leviticus that talk about these as demonic beings. And so I have satyrs show up in, in those novels as well, you know. And again, my point is, 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 um, is to sort of incorporate these strange theological things into the story in a way that will maybe even point people back to the Bible and read it and see it in a fresh new light. And um, yeah, so it's, you know, there's a lot of things that happen that don't make sense in the Bible. And there's a lot of things that are miraculous, like the red parting of the Red Sea, right? I mean, is that hard to believe? Of course it is for a secular person. Um, but a person who believes that, you know, there's a lot of things we don't understand and, and God, God c- could have done that. So we believe that. And so in the same way, I think that there's other weird things like these giants that show up that, um, you know, it's not just a matter of saying, look, the Bible says they're giants. It's also saying, but, but these giants show up in periodic places throughout the Bible. And then one step further, you start to see that these giants are not just this arbitrary thing of these are warriors who are seven to eight foot tall or some, you know, Goliath may have been nine foot nine, right? It's not just like, oh, there are these bad guys that are there. They're actually connected to a storyline that goes all the way back and, and is connected to God's intent to clean, to get out, to, to, to wipe out the evil seed of the serpent in Canaan so that he can bring his people into his holy land and ultimately his Messiah. And I think it's all connected to that. And that's sort of the storyline that I d- decided I wanted to tell. That storyline that I call the War of the Seed. The Seed of the Serpent, that is not only the Canaanites as a people, but, but in particular, the em- symbolized, they're emblemized in these Nephilim giants that, that end up becoming the Rephaim during the time of King David. You know, and... and um, so, so King David is sort of like the last, last in the line of those who, who are fighting the seed and serpent in the Old Testament. And he, of course, is, is the Messiah King. He's the anointed one. And David is the archetype for Messiah, right? or he's the, type, the antitype for Messiah. Messiah would be the son of David. And so he's a very crucial character in that, in that spiritual warfare that's going on in, inside the text. We're talking to Brian Gadow. The new book is called David Ascendant. It's the book seven in the uh, series that he has, Chronicles of Nephilim. And if you uh, are a fan of C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien, this is definitely your thing. And I love what he uses. He uses the term biblical imagination, you know, filling in the gaps, not trying to change what's there, but trying to kind of layer some backstory, some interesting interpretation. And, you know, your notes have some uh, thing here I'd like you to speak on briefly. You know, you talk about there's an appendix that uh, provides some interesting biblical and ancient Near Eastern research and that kind of thing. Speak a little bit about that and, and how you feel that can help guide people to, uh, to join you on this journey. Yeah, well, you know, look, I'm retelling Bible stories, and I'm trying to stay true to the text. And so I realize that my dominant audience are going to be people, you know, usually basically Christians or maybe Jews who love the Old Testament, but, you know, mostly probably going to be Christians. And what? Be careful, this is not, these are not Christian novels, you know, they're not going to be safe, family-friendly, because I believe that, that the Bible has a lot of sex and violence in it, and there's a lot of evil, and the reason why is, I believe that, that the power of the redemption in your story is only equal to the accuracy that you depict the evil from which you're redeemed. So if you don't depict a very realistic evil, your redemption just doesn't have any guts to it. It, do, it, does, it doesn't impact people. So I show the evils of that world at that time. Um, I don't. I try to be like the Bible, but the Bible has, you know, the Bible has some pretty gruesome things in there, you know. And uh, you know, cutting off four hundred foreskin or four hundred, cutting off two hundred foreskins of Philistines, and you know, a lot of gang rapes and chopping off heads and all this kind of stuff. So I have some of that in there, but then I show, but I do it because I want to show the power of God. And um, um, I, I hope I'm. Sorry if I'm a little too off topic, but I'm going to get there. <laughs> um, so, so my point is just that this isn't, this isn't these novels. 
you know, be careful. The rated PG-13. So, uh, but nevertheless, that's my audience. And so far, Christians have been loving them. So they like they like the realism of it, and they believe that the redemption is powerful. But nevertheless, because that's my my audience, they have a high respect for the Bible. So I want to, and and I know that they that you know when you're when you're retelling a Bible story, that's on sacred ground, right? So. I want to show that respect and help those who might have a hard time understanding what, wait a minute, is he, is he incorporating fantasy and fairy tales into the Bible? What, what, is that, you know, reducing the Bible to fantasy? No, no, not at all. In fact, what I'm doing is very similar to what the Bible itself does in terms of weaving in imagination with real history and real events that God did. But nevertheless, um, in order to explain that for those who would appreciate that, and to, and to appreciate that, the stuff that I come up with is not out of thin air. I actually do a lot of research into ancient history and the Bible. So I wanted to provide an appendix at the back of each book, and David Ascendant has one too, and um, where I provide the biblical and ancient historical research so that people can sort of appreciate where it comes from. And for those who might not understand it, it might help them understand it better. And uh, so far, I've been surprised that a lot of people have been telling me, I like the appendix as much as I like the novel. So that's, that's been encouraging. So what I did was I took all the appendices out of each of the novels. There's, there's eight total. And um, there's only seven. The seventh novel's out. The eighth novel's not. But I have the appendix already written for the eighth novel. That's the research, right? So I took all eight appendices, put them in one single book called When Giants Were Upon the Earth. And you can get that in Amazon, but... What that is, is that's for the people who just want to stick with the Bible historical research and don't want to get into the novel or whatever. And uh, people have been, been loving that because it really shows the continuity of what I'm talking about here. It's not just this arbitrary, bizarre, weird things that are in the Bible. There's a connection, and, and I, I make that connection. So people have been really enjoying the appendices, and, and it's been a real blessing. And that's where I can really tell you, folks, I really do enjoy it. I, I share this passion with Brian. I uh, I stole from Brad Thor, he uses the term faction. I'm not sure that's quite exactly the same we're talking about the Bible, but I do understand the parallel that we're trying to do of getting you to sort of uh, take that journey and take that ride into a deeper level. And the appendix definitely does that. And, and I want to close out with Brian here because it's a great a uh, great series. It kind of comes to a culmination with Jesus Triumphant, which is, uh, as you say, the eighth book. Uh, can you speak to that a little bit and kind of give people a little idea of, you know, what Christ will be doing in that uh, final, I don't say it's the final chapter, because who knows, right? God might have another book yeah, exactly. for you. Exactly. Yeah, no, that's a good one. Um, well, that's going to be wild. All I can tell you is it's going to be wild. Now, there is a, um, um, you know, people might say, well, what do giants have to do with Jesus? Um, there aren't any giants, literally, uh, in the Gospels. However, there are some supernatural connections to everything that I've been talking about in the Chronicles of the Nephilim. Um, in particular, I'm, I'm following one tradition, and this is one ancient Christian tradition, and, and that is about demons. You know, when Christ starts his ministry, what does he do? He does a lot of casting out of demons. Well, what does that mean? Is he just showing power and saying, I'm God, I can cast out demons? No, there's more to it than that. But guess what? The Bible doesn't say where evil spirits come from. It just says that they're there. And uh, people assume, well, they're fallen angels. No, no, they're not, because fallen angels are actually have angels actually have a flesh to them, a body to them. It's not exactly like ours, because it can obviously go through through different through walls and stuff like that, right? Like Christ's resurrected body. You know, but nonetheless, it is flesh because angels eat food. In the book of Genesis, they eat food, and Jesus ate food as a resurrected body, too. But um, so my point is that it's, it's a different kind of flesh, but it is a flesh, whereas evil spirits are just spirits seeking body. But there is a tradition that um, in the ancient Christian church that is connected to the book of First Enoch that suggests that demons are the spirit of dead Nephilim, because the Nephilim were hybrids of angels and humans. So because of that strangeness, demons come from them. I'm not sure if that's entirely true, but it's, it's a fascinating concept, and it seems to work. And it also works theologically with what Christ is doing, because he's casting out the seed of the serpent as he comes in as the Messiah King of the land of Israel. And ultimately, and there's another ancient Christian tradition that Christ, and this is in the Apostles' Creed, that when he died, he went to hell. 
And, and that's uh, a great and that's a great piece of the story that I just can't wait to read, folks. You guys have talked yeah, heard I, me talk about this piece in particular. You know, where did he go for three days? And this whole descent into hell story is one that I personally have always wanted to flesh out as well. So I can't wait to get Brian's interpretation. Yeah, it's gonna it's gonna be wild, but you know, it's gonna fit in with everything that comes before it. So I would recommend that before the, the it'll won't come out till next year. It'll probably be a year before it comes out because there's a lot going to go into this. Uh, so get reading on the series now because you do want to read the Jesus one in, in context because it sort of is an amazing conclusion of everything that was was before it. And uh, yeah, that's a, that's about all I'll reveal about that. But but right now it's David Ascended. It just got released. It's only exclusively though at Amazon, um, but it's on Audible Books. You can get it as an audiobook or as a Kindle or as a paperback. Um, but uh, that's where you can get it. And if, if you want to get more information on this, uh, my website, chroniclesofthenephilim.com, chroniclesofthenephilim.com, you should, you'll be able to figure out the spelling. <laughs> well, we'll but, link to that uh, for you folks. We'll make sure you got links to the Amazon as well as Chronicles right. of the Nephilim. And Brian, you've got some great stuff on the site that kind of really helps kind of pull the whole universe together for people. Yeah, yeah. I have all the books on there, and I ha- not all the books, but I have I have material related to all the books. You can you can get free articles that that deal with the, the research that I've done. You can get uh, book trailers, author videos where I explain things, as well as each book. You click on each book, and you you can see what the characters are in the book because I actually casted it. I have pictures, artwork. I have little explanations of the stories. So if you want to learn a little bit about it before exploring and buying the books, you can feel free to go to the website and you'll find all kinds of stuff, as well as, you know, um, other interviews of me and, and review, book reviews of the book and stuff like that. So everything you want to know about the series, you can find out at chroniclesofthenephilim.com. Brian Gadawa, it is the David Ascendant. It's a great, great uh, series, folks. You need, you need to jump in with both feet. Make sure you catch yourself up. This is book seven. And uh, we can't wait for more. And it is definitely something they were going to link to all that. And uh, can't thank Brian enough for his time. Thanks for having me, Brandon.